What I'm thinking to talk with you about is the whole business of choosing the right book for the right child. Now, one of the first things that parents say to me is, when they're not very familiar with children's books, is, I don't know, how do I know if this book is for a four-year-old or an eight-year-old? There is only one answer to that. Take a four-year-old or an eight-year-old into the bookshop or into the library and let them choose. You'll very quickly find out. Research in publishing shows that, on the whole, we spend up to seven seconds deciding whether we're going to buy a book when we pick it off the shelf. Now, how are we going to spend that seven seconds? We look at the cover, and that's why there's such a lot of emphasis placed on the cover image in publishing for adults in recent years. And unfortunately, that becomes a, a matter of fashion and cloning and so on. I would like a dollar for every book for adults that was published in the last 15 years that has a rickety old wooden jetty heading out into a lake with no people on it. Now, what's that image about? Why did that image seem to capture so many book buyers' interests? What did it say, you know? I'm about to walk out into oblivion and jump off the end of the jetty into the water. I'm interested in the mystery of what's at the bottom of the lake. I don't know what it says, but boy, it's a powerful one. And it's still going. Another thing that I think has interested me about the, the whole cover thing is when I started publishing, you would have said that Australian book covers for young people were of very varied colours. Now, particularly for teens, the predominant colour is black. It's quite grim, quite dark. Uh, you know, clearly for teenagers in the United States, for obviously good reasons, books like The Hunger Games, a dystopian kind of fantasy of the future, has resulted in so many imitations that clearly that's an interest. I absolutely loathed The Hunger Games when I first read it. I thought this is so badly written. The idea of the book is so obvious. Um, I hate said uh, about the way that she got the idea for it, that she'd been watching reality television and a quiz show, and she thought, oh, wow, that's a good idea to combine that with children and, and government and so on. I thought, yeah, that's exactly how it reads. However, when one of my teaching colleagues, I said to her, well, what could we put on the syllabus that would be a fantasy book for teens? She said, oh, The Hunger Games, and I just... Uh, that's what you get for being democratic. I didn't really want to do it, but I thought, well, I offered, so now I have to do it. Well, my mind was completely turned around. I watched the students talk about that book like no other book outside of Harry Potter. Um, I didn't even have to try in the tutorials. They would just volunteer such enthusiasm, such interest. When I, you know, um, as any good teacher would, sort of suggested that maybe the language was a little bit clunky, a little bit obvious and so on, didn't matter at all. Now, that still doesn't persuade me that that's a good aspect of the book, the fact that the students didn't seem to notice it, or if they did notice it, they didn't care. The fact that I think the language doesn't have much quality in the writing, some of the teens that I've taught, or most of them, I would say, look at it and think, yeah, 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 but I don't care. The story's really great. The comparison in my own past reading would be the, the novel Sophie's Choice. I had no idea what that title meant. I picked it up because everyone was talking about it. And I picked it up, and when I came to the part where you know what the title Sophie's Choice meant, I was just devastated. I thought, oh, my God. So I would have to be in a situation to give up a member of my family. And that just cut right through to my heart. And clearly, that's one of the reasons that so many teens respond strongly to The Hunger Games. Because the real motivating factor for that plot is where Katniss has to save her sister. And that's what starts it rolling. And we're used to thinking of well, I guess the public discourse is that the last couple of generations of young people in the West anyway have been very self-concerned and very egotistical and, you know, only concerned about this is a selfie generation and so on. 
but clearly their enthusiasm for that book and that motive suggests that there's something else going on there um, and that the importance of family and connection is stronger than the public discourse has conveyed. So I get first thing is if you want to know which book for which child, take the child in and let the child choose. And will that result in mistakes? Yes, sometimes. But then, as I've suggested with my own reading, doesn't that happen to you too? Why should children be any different from us? We watch a television show or we pay to go and see a movie or um, we go on a holiday or whatever it is and it doesn't turn out to be exactly as good as we hoped it would be. Okay, so why is it that we put so much store on the child, this being an absolute hit with the child? I think it is because we're so focused on literacy. And if you go back to Ong's book about literacy and oracy, the oral tradition, literary tradition, he makes the point that we're so obsessed with literacy that we forget that the primary linguistic act is oral. That literature is only ever an attempt to write down and make permanent, to record the oral act of communication. So I guess coming to children's books and children's literature, it's really important for us to think of storytelling rather than literacy, because literacy is such a killer of a word. It would kill anyone's enthusiasm. It sounds medicinal. It sounds like it's good for you. If there's one thing for sure, any child in my country who's called Jenny or Tom, and they hear an adult say Jennifer or Thomas, if you're always called Jenny or Tom, you know what's coming next. Kids can smell a lecture coming a mile off. I'm sure it's the case in India too. And so if you approach a book for children with that kind of do-gooding motive, this is going to be good for you, this is going to help you, this is going to further you in your career and so on, uh-uh. You know what the best thing is? Is to leave the book lying around very casually in the house. Be seen reading. Kids are very curious about what adults are doing. If they see you uh, reading a book that looks interesting, but you make absolutely no comment on it and no attempt to interest them, but you just happen to leave it somewhere, they'll find it, they'll pick it up, they'll read it. The other bad thing some academic parents could do is to read the book that your child is reading and then offer to have a workshop about it, to sit down and have a family meeting or to discuss it with the child. So just I guess I want to encourage you, let the children choose. Next, don't be seen to be too enthusiastic about reading, especially anything like the word literacy. Just leave some books lying around or let them see that you love the books. And maybe that when they've seen you reading the book, and then they go to look for it because you look to say you were really enjoying it, they can't find it. That would be a good strategy, I would think. Which age groups? Well, the Children's Book Council of Australia divides children's ages up into roughly zero to four, five to eight, eight to 11, and over. There are some totally misguided people who think that the term young adult goes up to 25. There are some people in this room who will be quite offended at being called a young adult. I think that just shows they've never spoken to any young adults. My guess is that once you leave school, you just want to be a person. You don't really want to be a young anything, you know. So those categories are fairly loose. But the zero to four one is really about identifying the world, naming the world, learning words, obviously, learning concepts, but having fun too. I really want to encourage you in that age group not to discount the importance of pictures and of silence. As a bookseller, I found it very difficult to persuade adults to take a wordless picture book home. And people would say, quite explicitly, I want value in the book I'm buying. Now I get that, because we don't all have lots of money to spend on books, but value doesn't only get defined by how many words there are in the book. A wordless picture book is in fact highly valuable in all sorts of situations. It's highly valuable in the likelihood that you've got three children who want to occupy your two knees for reading time, and one of them is eight, one of them is four, and one of them is one. 
Uh, can you read the same book to those three children? Not if it's all about the words, no. If it's about the pictures, yes, you've got a chance. Pictures will also help you, wordless picture books, will also help you in the case of having a, another language. So in Australia, I volunteer with refugees, the part of Australia where I live. The refugees are basically from Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Cambodia, those sorts of places. And what's really wonderful is that if you're careful, you can choose the right picture book to give to an adult and they feel really comfortable with the whole idea because picture books are not just for littleies at all. Picture books are used in Australian high schools to teach children all sorts of design concepts, to teach them about the relationship between the word text and the picture text and so on, to teach them art history. So if people here are thinking, oh, picture books are really for little kids, for preschoolers, please rethink that and have an exploration of some, regardless of your language or your access to uh, you know, the, the whole idea of a children's book, you'll find a place and people will find a place in a book like that. So zero to four is very much, as I say, about naming and so on. Um, five to eight is the child in my country and maybe in yours as well, is where the child is having their first independent social occasions. Um, they're going to school, they're going to their first birthday parties, they're allowed to take little trips down the road without much supervision and so on. That means that it's not just the family and the home and the pets and the environment that is important, now it becomes a social environment very much. And very much becomes a, a theme here of friendship and friend, best friends becoming worst enemies and then becoming best friends again. So there are always fights in this age group. There's always comedy. There's always a bit of rudeness. Um, my eldest daughter, when I, she said to me, could she go to her first birthday party at school? And she was five and I said, yeah, sure. Would you drive me there? And I said, yes, of course I will. So she got all dressed up and I drove her. And as we got one block away from the party, she said, oh, dad, would you mind stopping here? Um, and I'll walk the rest of the way. I thought, you little cow, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm good enough to be the chauffeur, um, but not good enough to be seen with. So she got out of the car, I said, have a lovely time. She didn't even look over her shoulder at me. Goes off and uh, has a wonderful time. And she was at the center of this cluster of girls that suddenly formed around her on the footpath, half a block away. That's what this age group is about and therefore strong friendships and then they have a fight and the next day they hate each other's guts and then something happens to renew the friendship again. So there's a lot of that, a lot of action in that age group, um, not much description. Then the next one, is 8 till 11, is furthering that social development but also a strong awareness of the world, both geographically and historically. Don't even think of giving a child under seven um, a book about history. For them, they're wondering if you as their parent met William Shakespeare or if you ever saw a dinosaur. That's about the level of their historical knowledge. But certainly around about that age group, around seven or eight, most kids start to realise that there are places other than their, you know, their own immediate environment and that there are times other. And so a lot of that fiction particularly is about time and place and setting a more complex kind of social environment. And then with the teen literature, we go back inside the internal exploration. Yes, there's, of course, interaction with others, but here it's a lot of self-exploration, a lot about um, sexuality, about sex, about guilt and conscience, about doing the right thing, about your independence as a person, you know, what rights do you have to speak up or to do something other than what your parents want and so on. So broadly speaking, that's the map.